Welcome again. This is Luke chapter 5. We're going to be talking about how Jesus called his first disciples, how Jesus healed a man with leprosy and also a paralyzed man, how Jesus called Levi and he ate with so-called sinners, and also how Jesus was questioned about fasting. So let's begin here at verse 1. So this is Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Now, while the multitude pressed on him and heard the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them, and they were washing their nets. He entered into one of the boats, which was Simon's or Shimon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Shimon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Shimon answered him, Master, we worked all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the net. When they had done this, they caught a great multitude of fish, and their net was breaking. They beckoned to their partners in the, in the other boat that they should come and help them. They came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But Shimon Peter, or Simon Peter, when he saw it, fell down at Jesus' knees, on Yeshua's knees, and said, Depart from me. I am a sinful man, Lord. For he was amazed at and all who were with him at the catch of fish which they had caught. And so also were Yaakov, or James, and Yochanan, John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partakers, or excuse me, partners with Simon. Yeshua said to Shimon, Yeshua said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people alive, or now on, you will be fishers of men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man full of leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, saying, Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I want to. Be made clean. Immediately his, lep his leprosy left him, and he commanded him to tell no one. But go your way and show yourself to the priest and offer your cleansing according to, that, according to what Moses commanded for a testimony to them. But the report concerning him spread much more, and great multitudes came together to hear him, to hear, and to be healed by him of their infirmities. But he withdrew himself into the desert and prayed. So let me stop here just for a sec. Let's go back to the beginning here when Jesus got into Simon's boat. And, uh, and it says here, he taught, he taught the multitudes from the boat. And then he told Simon to uh, put down his nets for a catch. Simon said, look, we worked all night. We didn't catch anything. But he said, at your word, we will do it. And they did it, and they caught so much that even two boats couldn't hardly hold the fish. Okay, so you got to wonder, this Jesus, this Yeshua, must have been known by Simon and his partners before the fact. I don't think Simon would allow just any old stranger to just to go into his boat and, you know, launch out from the land in, in, in his boat. I think that he, they must have had some kind of knowledge of Yeshua before the fact. Okay. Now, I mentioned this before in other Gospels that in the so-called New Testament Apocrypha, which we will get to, um, Lord willing, uh, there is a lot of different things that happened before, uh, before let's say, the baptism of Jesus. Or, or, you know, a lot of different things when he was a child and as a young adult that is not recorded in the, uh, the typical, you know, four Gospels in, our, in your typical Bible. We will get to all that stuff. Now, could it be true that 
Jesus did a lot of things that is not recorded here? Well, it says that in the book of John. It says in the book of John that um, that Jesus did so many things that's not recorded that if we were to record everything, you know, or if John or whoever would have written everything that Jesus did, even the world itself would not be able to contain all the books that would be written. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that, that is not said here. There's a lot of things you got to think about that you, you got to kind of read between the lines. So, Jesus must have been known for having a very powerful word and maybe a miracle working ministry, miracle working, a miracle worker before the fact. Otherwise, why would Peter even listen to him? Why would he say, you know, we worked all night and we didn't catch anything, but at your word, we will let down the net. So there's a, there's a spark of faith there. There's a spark of, hey, you know what? We went through a lot of toil here for nothing. Hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Our experience shows us that nothing's going to happen. But I trust your word enough to know that it is worth trying at least. Okay. So I think that Peter knew uh, about things that we don't read about. Um. Now, it says here in verse 8, now it says, Depart from me. And Peter said to, to Jesus, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, Lord. Again, like, would it... You think about it. If, if all that Simon knew about Jesus is that this guy just came and said, Put your nets into the water, and, and he did, and, and he caught a big school of fish. If that's all he knew about him, why would he be so shaken? Why would he be so afraid? So much to say, listen, <laughs> Lord, you are just too holy for me. Uh, depart from me. Get away from me because I am sinful. You are holy. Um, you know, I'm a sinful man, he said, Lord. Um, he was amazed, it says in verse 9, and all who were with him at the catch of, the, at the catch of fish, which they had caught, and so also were James and John. That's Yaakov and Yochanan. Um, so, yeah, I think that there were uh, a, there was things that they knew about Jesus that is not recorded here. Again, Jesus just said, you know, from now on you will be fishers of men. Uh, and they just left everything. <laughs> How many people could go to someone fishing now and and say here cash your net over here you're going to catch a lot of fish and they did and they, and they caught a lot of fish and they'll say okay now you know don't be afraid you know basically follow me i i will be uh you, you're going to be fishers of men from now on how many people would just leave everything i mean leave their homes leave their leave everything they have leave their family leave their friends and follow that person without trusting or without knowing that person more than just just a one little incident one little run-in i think that it's very possible that uh simon knew jesus a whole lot more uh here we got um now the next story that we that we read here is uh the man with leprosy now he came to the lord uh and he he said uh in verse 12, the last half of verse 12, he said, Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and said, I want to be, be made clean. Now, I know there's a lot of faith, uh, uh, faith, uh, charismatic and Pentecostal uh, type of Christians out there that would say, you know, this is a kind of an exception to the rule. You're supposed to have faith faith to be healed and you know this is a you know this is kind of like the exception to the rule so nowadays we should never ask if uh but rather we know what what jesus will is um that's reading a lot into this okay jesus didn't go on to explain that he wants everybody to be healed instantly all the time look at lazarus he waited for lazarus um so, yeah, I mean, uh, we see that G Jesus' will is for people to be healed, especially if they come to him. And trust me, 
like I said, Simon here came to Jesus and said, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. When you come to Jesus, when you come to the most holy man who ever lived and ever will live, when you come to the Lord God Almighty, um, you can't come with sin in your life. In a, At least you can't come to him in a way that you are asking something of him. You you humble, you submit yourself to him when you ask, you know, you ask uh, that, he, that uh, you know, for healing or such like that. Um, so there's a lot more, again, uh, that is that this story doesn't, you know, doesn't literally say that we got to actually take into account. Um, for example, you know, when people came to him for healing, they came to him in humility. They came to him submissive to him. They came to him in repentance. For the, I mean, you'd have to in the most part, except for, you know, some of the people that were, that came to him, you know, accusing him or trying to, you know, get him on something, trying to accuse him, trap him or something like that. Um, I mean, that's a totally different situation. But coming to Jesus uh, just for, to receive something from him, you must submit to him. You must be humble, especially seeing who Jesus was, what, what he stood for. Um, even Peter couldn't stand before him without saying, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Um, so, yeah, uh, in verse 14, Jesus told the man who was healed to go and show himself to the priest, uh, you know, and offer your, uh, an offer for your cleansing according to what Moses commanded for a testimony to them. So Jesus was telling him, go, do what the, 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 the law of Moses, so to speak, law of Moses commands you to do. Make the offering, do the animal sacrifice, you know, do what you're supposed to do according to the instructions that God gave you. Um, Jesus could have said, he could have said, Oh, and you're healed, you know, um, you know, thank you, you know, go tell everybody that I'm such a healer, that I'm, that I'm here to heal you, and I'm here just to show the love of the Father to you, and, uh, and just go your way, you know, it's my grace that, that will, will cover you, you don't have to go by the law anymore, you don't have to worry about being so specific and doing everything that the, that the, that the instructions uh, of Moses, uh, uh, told you to do. Ah, forget about it. You're already healed. You've got my grace. You've got your my love and my blessings. You know. See you later. That's not what he said. He said, "Okay, so now you're healed. Now follow through with the rest of the commandments." Here, Jesus always taught Torah. Never taught anything against Torah. Rather, he only clarified and also. Um, he shot down a lot of the uh, teachings of the Pharisees that were that added to the Torah or that misinterpreted the Torah. Uh, so you need to understand that. So um, he withdrew himself into the desert and prayed. Very important for you uh, from time to time to go away by yourself, you know, into a deserted place and pray. Very important for you to recharge. Jesus did it time and time again. Verse 17. On one of those days he was teaching, and there were there were Pharisees and teachers of the law, teachers of the Torah, sitting by, who, who had come out of every village of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. The power of the Lord was with him to heal them. Again, here we got a very unique phrase here, or a very unique sentence. The power of the Lord was with him to heal them, which implies that there are times when the power of the Lord is not with him to heal them. Okay? So there are times, there are places, there there is a manifest and tangible power of the Lord that can be present to heal. Verse 18. Behold, Men brought a paralyzed man on a cot, and they sought to bring him to lay before Jesus. Not finding a way to bring him in, not finding a way to bring him in because of the multitude, they went up to the housetop and let him down through the, t the tiles with his cot into the middle of, uh, before Jesus. 
Seeing their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this that speaks blasphemies? For who can, begin, who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, answered them, Why are you reasoning so in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk. But that, you, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the par paralyzed man, I tell you, arise, take up your cot, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them and took up that which he was laying on and departed to his house, glorifying God. Amazement took hold on all, and they glorified God. They were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Now, here again, and again, I've said this before in, in other teachings and other gospels, but there is a, uh, what will I say? There is a consensus that sickness comes because of sin. If there's sin there, sickness can come because of sin. Okay, disease, sickness, infirmities, whatever you may call it, will come because of sin. So, on the flip side, when sin is forgiven, you pull the rug out from under sickness and disease. So, when sin is forgiven, blotted out, the disease disappears. The, the sickness disappears. I've seen this happen uh, personally. Um, a number of years ago, I used to go door to door, uh, knocking on doors, uh, just witnessing about, about Jesus, just witnessing about Jesus. And, uh, there was a, there's a, um, a protocol that we used to follow where if a man needed prayer, I would do it. Or if a woman needed prayer, we had another lady on the team that would do prayer for ladies. Well, there was this elderly woman who was in a, uh, in like an older home, an old folks home kind of thing. And she was um, crippled. Uh, she had to, she walked around with like a cane and walker, this kind of thing. And um, apparently she had uh, some things against her mother. Like she was really bitter against her mother, like really bitter. And so she had a lot of things that her mother did wrong that she just never forgave her mother for. Um, and uh, the lady that was on uh, the team that was working with me, led this old lady into a prayer of forgiveness, told this lady that she needs to forgive her mother. Now, we know the scriptures. Jesus taught us, if you forgive, then God will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, the wrongs that they've done against you, then God does not forgive you. It's just the way it goes. You cannot go to heaven with any kind of unforgiveness or bitterness in your heart. Let me say it again. You will not go to heaven with any kind of grudge against anybody. The Torah says you should not hold a grudge against another, against your neighbor. Love your neighbor, but don't hold a grudge against them. Jesus also taught that if you forgive, then God will forgive you. As the, as the Lord's Prayer says, Father, forgive us as we, forgive, as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. If we don't forgive those who have sinned against us, Father won't forgive us. And if we're not forgiven, we have sin on our account. And with sin on our account, heaven is not your home. I don't care how many times you say Jesus is Lord. And Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. Sorry. You are wrong if you think it does. It doesn't matter. You got to take all the scripture into context. And look what we, we, we talked about here just in the past few, uh, past few sessions. Satan's trick is to pull one passage out of context from the rest of all the rest of scripture. He, showed, he, he told Jesus, you know, throw yourself down. And he starts quoting the, the book of Psalms, Psalm 91. Ignoring Deuteronomy. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. In the same way, don't pull out this, well, all you got to do is confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart and you will be saved, and ignore the other, the other 
principles, the other parts of Scripture, the other instructions, guidelines, and rules. Okay? It just won't work. Um, so, when that lady forgave her mother, she was instantly healed. She, don't, she didn't need to... She was absolutely healed. She wasn't crippled anymore. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that everybody who's crippled has got something against her mother. But, hey, if you got a sickness or a disease, the first thing you should do is go through your life and say, is there any sin in your life at all? You need to repent of it. After you've repented of every known sin, I mean, ask God. I've had, you know, there was this one... Uh, there's this one very well-known charismatic leader in the world. And if I, if I were to mention his name, you would, a lot of people would know him. But he said, you know, there's a lot of people that claim to hear God, hear the, you know, hear the, the Holy Spirit speak to them. But he says, I guarantee there's one way you can hear God. And I love what he said. He said, if you have trouble hearing the voice of God, just do, just do one thing. Ask God to show you your sins. And you'll hear the voice of God. God is quick to answer prayers of honesty, prayers of repentance, prayers that lead people to repentance. Remember, Jesus said, when one person repents, all of heaven rejoices. Very, very important. He didn't, he didn't say when one person says the sinner's prayer, when one person confesses Jesus is Lord. No. He said when one person repents, all of the angels of heaven rejoice. Have a party. It's very, very important. So ask God. After you've asked, after you have worked through your life and worked, removed every sin that you know of, that is a sin. Ask God to show you everybody in your life that you need to forgive, that you're holding a grudge against. Perhaps it's something that somebody who did something against you personally. Perhaps somebody did something against those whom you love. Perhaps somebody did something against a group of people um, or whatever it is. I mean, some of the craziest things that people hold grudges uh, about, um, whatever it is, ask God to show you. And he will. If you, ask, if you pray an honest prayer, you'll get attention. You'll get his attention. Like it says, if you seek the Lord with all your heart, you will find him. If you seek him with all your heart, that means a lot, okay? So, um, if, you're, if you have repented of all your sin and you have forgiven all, you don't have a grudge against anybody, you can expect, I mean, we don't want to be presumptuous here. We're not doing this for blessing. We're doing it because we are commanded of God to do it because we're servants of the Lord. But, hey, you could get miraculously healed healed of depression healed of the stress in your life healed of the uh, any kind of disease you have anything i mean even cavities in your teeth <laughs> i know that sounds crazy but hey god can do everything god can do anything and he has okay so, yeah, let's come before him as a little child and believe and receive and enjoy his presence. Verse 27, after these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. Not a lot of people call him Levi, Levi, and it's commonly known that it's commonly believed that Levi is uh, Matthew. Okay, uh, so after these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to them, he said to him, follow me. Verse 28, he left everything and rose up and followed him again. If you read what I read, if you heard what I heard in regards to the extra biblical documents, the so-called New Testament Apocrypha, about the things that have happened with Jesus when he was born his swaddling cloth, how that caused, when miracles happened there. Um, I mean, when the, his teachers, when he went to so-called school, uh, I mean, the school would be like 
as as we read about me earlier, um, you know, just staying in the temple and talking to the Pharisees and and the teachers of the law, um, and just the wonderful, wonderful miracles that, according to these apocryphal books, uh, have been happening since Jesus was born. Uh, and so, if that was the case, no wonder they said, "Jesus said, follow me." We know about this this man. We know about uh, about how God is with him. We better follow him. Uh, so that makes sense. That they would just up and leave everything. Uh, uh, so t- verse twenty nine. Levi made a great feast for him in his house. Oh my! I would. I would too. Uh, there was a great crowd of tax collectors and others who were reclining with them. Their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? Okay. Back up to verse 29, the last half of verse 29. It says, There was a great crowd of tax collectors and others, doesn't say sinners, who were reclining with them. Now, Tax collectors were known as being bad people, thieves, just like how a lot of the government people are today. Tax collectors were known as being ripoffs, people who most people didn't like. Tax collectors, um, so a great crowd, a great crowd, excuse me, of tax collectors and others, says the narr- says the narrator, were reclining with them, Jesus and his disciples. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees murmured against his disciples. Now, the scribes and Pharisees didn't call them tax collectors and others. The the scribes and the Pharisees called called them tax, tax collectors and sinners. Jesus answered them, Those who are healthy have no need for a physician, but those who are sick do. I have come to call the right. I have, excuse me. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay. Take note, please. Take note. Jesus could have said here, "I have come for everybody. I have come for everybody, far and wide, from the east to the west, from the north to the south. Everybody in the whole wide world, I have come. Every, all of you, you, you need, you need me. All of you, I've come for you all." He said, I have not come to call the righteous. Now, we know there were righteous people back then. We read about Anna, Anna, the high priest, excuse me, the uh, prophetess being being righteous. We read about especially Zacharias and Elizabeth, the the parents of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, being righteous and blameless. It says they walked in all the commandments of the Lord. They They didn't sin in anything according to the scriptures. Those were the righteous. Jesus made it clear. I didn't come for them. I'm not here for them. I'm not, I didn't come for them. That's not my purpose. I come to call sinners to repentance. Now, he could have said, I didn't come to hang around with the righteous, but I come to hang around sinners. That's not what he said. He said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There's a big difference. He just didn't hang around with the sinners. He just didn't work with the sinners and talk with the sinners and joke with the sinners and gossip with the sinners. He had a purpose. He had a job to do. He called them to repentance. You, repent. You're a sinner. Repent. Okay? Just like the doctor says, You go to a doctor, if you're sick, the doctor can say, you have a sickness, you have a disease, you're diagnosed. So here you go. You need to get well. And here's how you get well. Okay. Jesus is the same way. You're a sinner. You need to repent. This is how you should repent. You know, forsake sin, love God, love me, love each other and forsake all sin. And forgive all people. Everybody in your life. Don't hold a grudge against anybody. Your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your cousins, your friends, the next door neighbor. No grudges are allowed. Zero tolerance. A lot of times what a person doesn't say is, 
is more powerful than what they do say. You know, when you're in court and you're proving evidence, a lot of times you can prove things by what someone does not say just as much as what you prove about, about you can prove things about what somebody does not say just as easy as you prove things about what people do say uh, about a certain thing. Verse 33. They said to him, Why do John's disciples often fast and pray? Likewise also the disciples of the Pharisees. Now, you need to understand, every rabbi had disciples. So the fact that Jesus came, was called a Jewish rabbi, called disciples, it wasn't just some cool little cult that he got going. It wasn't just some cool little club that he started or a cool little church. No, it was... A common occurrence in those days. Every rabbi, every Jewish rabbi had their disciples. Okay? So why does why do John's disciples often fast and pray? Likewise also the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. He said to them, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? He's talking about something happy here. He's talking about a wedding coming. He's talking about something to rejoice about. Verse 35, But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. You see, fasting, there, there is a number of different purposes and, um, uh, what do you call it, motivations for fasting. Uh, one motivation for fasting is just being sad. you just so, it's mourning. You don't feel like eating. Uh, another motivation for fasting is just to a spiritual discipline for self-discipline. You teach yourself to deny yourself, deny your lust, deny your, um, you know, y- your own needs for, for someone else. Uh, another purpose of fasting is just to humble yourself. Okay. Um, so yeah, there are many different purposes of fasting here. Jesus brings it to the, uh, to the table that, uh, why would anybody fast when you got the bridegroom with them? Uh, it's reason to rejoice. It's reason to feast, not to fast. But the bridegroom, the bridegroom, excuse me, will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Verse thirty-six. He also told a parable to them. No one puts a piece of new uh, from a new garment on an old garment, uh, or else he will tear the new, and the, and I, also the piece from the new will not match the old. Because the new garment shrinks, right? So you, you sew a, a patch of a of new garment on an old garment, it will shrink and tear. Um, no one puts new wine into old wine skins, or else the new wine skin the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilt. The skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins, and both are preserved. No man, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. So he was saying, basically, look, at, we, got, we got something new happening here, okay? We've got a, a totally new thing here going on. It's a new container. It's a new um, substance in that container. I am here with you. Uh, I am the bridegroom. I am the Lord God Almighty. Uh, this is not just your typical, you know, rabbi or your typical prophet. Uh, this is something brand new. So that concludes the reading of Luke chapter 5. I pray that you were very blessed by the reading and by the discussion that we had here. Hey, if you got any more to add, please add it in the comments below. And as you go and meditate, remember we're commanded to meditate upon the Word of God, especially upon His laws and His rules, His guidelines, His instructions. As you do, may God enrich you enrich you, spiritually enrich you, open the eyes of your understanding and give you wonderful shalom, peace. Thanks again for watching.